So hi, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Paul Ligeti, and I'm the Vice President of the Historical Society of West Windsor. Um, we unfortunately don't have Regina Honore tonight. Uh, she's also a member of the Histor oh, board member of the Historical Society. Uh, she had a family commitment. So I'm going to be taking over the uh, narration duties that she had otherwise uh, was otherwise going to be doing. So before I start, a quick note on, um, there we go, about the Historical Society. So we are a 100% unpaid volunteer nonprofit that was founded in 1983 and composed of your friends and neighbors. Uh, we manage the West Windsor History Museum. You can see the uh, one of the farmhouse, the 1700s era farmhouse at the museum here. And it's located at 50 Southfield Road, just a minute down from Grover Middle School. Uh, we have uh, several centuries old buildings to explore, uh, and again, including this farmhouse. And I encourage you to visit us. Uh, we benefit the township in a variety of ways, from public education to, to community events, to placemaking scholarships and more. However, we simply can't do this without community support and we rely on donations in order to operate. So please, please, please consider donating or volunteering. Um, and I'm gonna have a link at the end of this slideshow in case you're interested in either donating or volunteering or learning more in general about West Windsor history. Um, so again, thank you in advance. Um, now, another thing I'll point out before the lecture begins is that in 2022, we published a full length book about West Windsor's entire history from the ice age to the present day. You can buy it at the link shown here at the bottom left of the screen. Uh, the book, of course, does explore the history of local education somewhat, but this lecture goes into much more detail. That being said, the book has a breadth of topics, not just education, it's the entire history, again, from the ice age to the present day. Um, even so, this lecture um, is, uh, the attempt is to narrate it in about 40 minutes, give or take. Um, and that covers about 250, 260 years of educational history. So uh, just a bit of a disclaimer at the beginning, I naturally can't include every single teacher, every single principal, every single group, <laughs> right? Um, so, and, and some of these topics will have to be relatively surface level. Uh, but there are there is going to be questions and answers at the end. So in case you do have questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I'm sure if I'm not able to, I, I know that there's a number of longtime husbands or residents in the chat, and I'm sure they'll be happy to. Uh, they'll pick off where I pick up where I'm not able to do so. Another thing to note is that uh, this uh, that this lecture specifically focuses more on West Windsor history than it does on Plainsboro. Um, so it, for West Windsor's history, we're going to be doing everything from the mid-1700s to the present day. Uh, in contrast, Plainsboro, our focus is mainly going to be from 1969 onwards, although we have a bit of uh, early 1900s history as well. So until then, until the questions and answers at the end, please uh, e either mute yourselves or, or if you want to you know, type in any questions in the chat, feel free, but I'll get to them at the end of the uh, lecture. So now let's start at the beginning. Uh, so West Windsor's first school was reputedly built prior to 1760 off of Route 1 in Washington Road. Uh, this was a large timber structure erected by local parents who paid teachers directly. And this was also at the time when West Windsor, well, it, not, not exactly at the time, but it was a, a, about a de within a few decades of West Windsor's first large wave of colonial settlement in the mid-1700s. Um, and again, parents paid teachers directly. So this, this earliest form of schooling in West Windsor was a sort of private education. This schoolhouse and others that would appear later typically handled grades one through eight. Now at the time, West Windsor was a sparsely populated farming community. Um, so class sizes uh, uh, were usually small. Uh, farm boys in fact are said to have often attended school on, only during certain seasons. So, and this is one of the more interesting facts that I've learned, some reputedly graduated when they were as old as 25 or 26 years old. And we're talking about graduating from eighth grade. Students often sat on benches, they wrote upon slate slabs, and they got their warmth from a wood-burning stove. Uh, discipline could be harsh, ranging from the whack of a ruler to monetary fines, and text and lessons were heavily influenced by Christianity. And of course, back then, uh, children either walked or rode horses to school. This system of private education existed for many decades. However, this changed in April of 1828 when the township committee voted to allocate $300 to employ public school teachers. The next month, 
four sub-districts were formally organized within an overall West Windsor school district, each with their own schoolhouse, Dutchneck, Edinburgh, Parksville, and Pensneck. And one thing I want to emphasize is this was a West Windsor specific school district. We did not combine with Plainsboro until 1969, and I'm going to explore that a lot later in the lecture. So now we'll explore each of these districts and their schoolhouses in alphabetical order in the ensuing slides. So first is Clarksville. This district overlapped both West Windsor and Lawrence townships, and the schoolhouse repeatedly built in 1822 sat on the Lawrence side near the intersection of Clarksville and Quakerbridge Roads, and you're going to see that in the next slide. Its first teacher was David Dye, who headed a district of just 30 students. Of course, other teachers served over the generations, but I wanted to point him out because he was the first. In 1917, when Dutch Neck and Pence Neck schools were built, which again, we're going to explore in later slides, the West Windsor half of the school's students left the Clarksville School, and in 1926, the building was converted and was shut down for good as an educational institution, and thereafter converted into both storage and a religious gathering place. The, bur the building burned down in 1937, and nothing remains except for various documents and photos. So again, the school was located roughly where this ye uh, yellow star is, uh, where the Casey Prime Steakhouse exists today, at the intersection of Quaker Bridge Road and Clarksville Road and Grover's Mill Road. So next alphabetically, we have the Dutch Neck Schoolhouse. This was built by the year 1818 at the very latest. It could have probably been built uh, significantly earlier. And the building originally stood at the intersection of South Mill Road and Village Road's east and west. So this is the very heart of a community called Dutch Neck in the center of West Windsor. Um, it was first headed by Reverend Daniel Durrell, who was also the head pastor of the Dutch Neck Presbyterian Church directly next door. Now, this school, like the Clarksville Schoolhouse, burned down, except this one happened in the uh, year 1850. And a replacement was built within the next 10 years. At the same time, there was also a small, a, a different small schoolhouse in the rear of the church's graveyard that specifically served the church. Like other schoolhouses, the Dutch Neck Schoolhouse operated until 1917, when it was split in two, auctioned off to a local uh, uh, family, and turned into a house in a garage. And some of you might recognize this house if you live in the Dutch Neck area. This is at 516 Village Road West, and that is what the Dutch Neck Schoolhouse is today. That and the garage that you cannot see, it's off screen uh, uh, to the right of the screen. Uh, but that's what became of the Dutch Neck Schoolhouse. It still stands as a private residence. Next in alphabetical order, we have the Ed Edinburgh Schoolhouse. This, is this was located off of Old Tretton Road, and this institution, whose earliest known teacher was Jonathan T. Hutchinson, was probably built in the early 1800s, and it served the Edinburgh community, which was largely centered around the intersection of Edinburgh Road, Old Tretton Road, and Windsor Edinburgh Road. It too lasted until 1917, and again, this date 1917 is a common theme here, uh, because that's when Dutch Neck and Penn's Neck schools were built. So it lasted until 1917, and it was also auctioned off. It was demolished in the mid-1900s by the uh, Carlucci family who owned the property at the time. And again, here is a map showing where the Edinburgh Schoolhouse used to exist, just off of Old Tretton Road and near its intersection with Robinsville Road. And the community of Edinburgh is generally centered around Old Tretton Road, Edinburgh Road, and Windsor Road. Next, we have the Pence Neck Schoolhouse which I'd mentioned in one of the earliest slides was one of the first, well, actually reputedly the first schoolhouse constructed in West Windsor prior to 1760 off of Route 1, off of Route 1 and Lower Harrison Street. Uh, this is, again, said to have been a large timber frame building, and it was replaced a few times. Uh, first, in the 1850s, when the schoolhouse was uh, disassembled, moved uh, 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 several thousand feet down uh, uh, south west down Route 1 and reconstructed. Um, and uh, another time uh, it, uh, when it was moved further southwest down Route 1 and reconstructed again in the 1860s and 1870s. Now that was the latest iteration of the schoolhouse and it too closed down in 1917 and was auctioned off to the Mount family and became residence. Eventually the schoolhouse changed shape and it changed roof line over the years and we believe that there is a building which still stands off of Route 1 that may have been the schoolhouse seen here at 3637 Brunswick Pike, 
uh, directly across the road from Carnegie Center. Finally, the last of the schoolhouses that we're going to go into a, a little bit more detail of is the Princeton Junction Parsonage. Now, this was constructed in the mid-1800s off of Clarksville Road. Uh, it used to stand directly to the left of Morris Hawk School, if you're on Clarksville Road and facing Morris Hawk School. It was probably built sometime between 1828 and 1816, sorry, 1860, and why exactly it was called a Parsonage School is uncertain, but we're, we're beginning to collect evidence that may have been used uh, uh, relatively frequently as a religious gathering place. Uh, again, the, the same theme, it too shut down in 1917 and was converted into a house. Uh, in 1994, it was moved to the Skank Farmstead slash West Windsor History Museum, later reconstructed using entirely new materials. And in 2013, it opened as an exhibit on schooling in West Windsor. Now, uh, in fact, you can see the building here, uh, this photo taken a few years ago. Uh, looking a bit different from the previous photo, but still representative of, uh, of a local 1800s era school. Uh, one thing I want to note is that uh, two Sundays from now, so not this upcoming Sunday, but the Sunday after that, April 7th, from 1 to 4 p.m., where the uh, Historical Society is going to be having an open house at our museum, where you can come, you can explore, you can see thousands of artifacts in various historic buildings. This is one of them. So I encourage you all to attend. Again, this is April 7th from 1 to 4 p.m. at 50 Southfield Road. We're just a minute down from Grover Middle School. Now, those five schoolhouses that I just explored were not the only ones in West Windsor. Uh, there are a few other ones uh, that we don't have as much documentation for, but we know exist based on various maps. Uh, there was something called the Society House, which was at the intersection of Southfield Road and Village Road East. So essentially very close to where Grover Middle School is today and Village, uh, Village School as well. There was one off of Coverley Road in Old Tretton Road which we have almost no information about. And uh, again, as I had mentioned before, there was one in the cemetery behind the Dutch Neck Presbyterian Church that we're still gathering more information about. Now, as I've mentioned a few times, 1917 was a transformative year for West Windsor. Uh, this was during the turn of the century progressive movement that emphasized uh, reforms of various public institutions, in sc including schools. Now, relative to education, the movement emphasized standardization, a, rigor, a rigorous learning environment, uh, more modern facilities, uh, higher education beyond eighth grade, and much more. In this environment, West Windsor's old wooden schoolhouses began to look increasingly obsolete. So in 19, uh, sorry, 1917, four of them in Dutch Neck, Edinburgh, Penn's Neck, and, Prin and the Princeton Junction Parsonage were auctioned off to locals. The fifth, the Clarksville Schoolhouse, shut down a few years later. In their place, there were two new, much larger brick and stone schools that were built. These identical twins uh, were called the Dutch Neck School and the Penn's Neck School. I'll start with the Dutch Neck School, but even before going into that, uh, I need to talk about what existed before it. So back in the mid-1800s, West Windsor was not the affluent community that we know today. In fact, there was a lot of poverty, and the township had a position called overseer of the poor to manage a form of municipal welfare. Back then, uh, destitute residents, meaning ones who did not have a lot of money, often didn't have the funds to pay for a burial plot in anticipation of when they were to pass away. Um, and they also didn't have the connections necessarily or family members uh, in order to coordinate a uh, plot in a, a local church uh, graveyard. So when they died, the township had to decide what to do with their bodies. Uh, it's a little gruesome, but it was a reality that uh, the township had to deal with. In 1834, the overseer of the poor at the time, a man named Henry Dye, established a half-acre burial plot off of Village Road East, where the township could bury these residents. This is where the Dutch Neck School's southeastern parking lot exists today. Eventually, this burial ground also became a designated cemetery for African-American residents, um, and was also referred to uh, by certain names associated with that. However, when the Dutch Neck School was built directly adjacent in 1917, uh, the graveyard's bodies were dug up and relocated elsewhere. Although one source says that they were identified, uh, the historic society has only been able to find out about three individuals who are all members of the Updike family. 
Um, and we know that they were their their bodies were moved to the Cedar Hill Cemetery in Heightstown. It's also possible, but we haven't confirmed this yet, that a few others are buried at the Dutch Neck Presbyterian Church. Uh, moreover, when the Dutch Neck School expanded in the 1950s, apparently more bodies were discovered. So we're still doing research into what exactly happened after that point. Um, we're still, of course, trying to find out where these uh, uh, people who were buried there, where eventually they were moved to and who they were. So as mentioned, Dutch Neck School is one of the, uh, is West Windsor's oldest operating educational institution. It opened in 1917. It was originally a four classroom building run by a principal who also taught classes and planned bus routes. And you can see the original uh, size of the Dutch Neck School pictured here. The earliest known principal was a woman named Stella Costumator. And in the early days, uh, the principal's office was in the basement of the school, which with huge uncovered steam pipes running through it. In addition to math and reading, other classes like civics, business forms, and physio physiology typi uh, typified early 1900s education. Now, over the years, Dutch Neck, Dutch Neck School expanded multiple times. And it, of course, had multiple principals and teachers and thousands of students uh, uh, over the past 107 years now. So I won't be able to go into uh, anyone in full detail. However, uh, some ones to point out, uh, George Malone was its youngest principal at only 26 years old in 1937. Another named Almedia Pace was Westminster's first non-white principal, and we'll talk a bit about her later. Uh, back then, Dutch Neck School served a variety of grades, and, they, and it only became a K-3 uh, school around, I believe, the year 1990. Next, we have Penn's Neck School. Again, identical twin to Dutch Neck. If I go two slides back, you'll see that they looked basic. They're the same architecture because they were built to be more or less identical. Um, and I want to emphasize again that this school and Dutch Neck really deserve lectures in their own right. But since, again, this overall lecture is supposed to cover 260 years, and I kind of have to gloss over uh, 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 every subject in this uh, in this lecture. Uh, the Pentner School was opened as Dutch Neck's, again, identical twin in 1917, and its first principal was a man named Roy Stilwell, who also saw, oversaw a number of other schools in the district. Um, except, uh, sorry, not the district, the area. Except for the addition of a cafeteria in the 1950s, this structure largely remained the same in comparison to Dutch Neck School throughout uh, its entirety uh, of uh, usage as a school. Now, the school's most memorable leader was undoubtedly a woman named Georgiana Hawk, who you can see in the lower left. Uh, she became principal in the early 1920s when she was also in her 20s and began to teach seventh and eighth grades. At the time, there were about 130 students, most of whom aspired to be farmers, although this obviously changed with each class as the years passed. Field trips include walking to nearby farms or to the Delaware and Raritan Canal, farm festivals, and there was usually a picnic at the end of each year. Um, although I don't know, uh, I, I still need to do more research into this. Uh, I know that one of the people uh, uh, watching this will appreciate. Um, I've been told that Georgiana supposedly also knew Albert Einstein, who's said to have visited the school uh, at least once. Nevertheless, what is known about her is that she was a very popular principal, known for being uh, uh, firm but kind. Over 900 former students and friends are said to have attended a joint retirement party for her and another longtime teacher, Mrs. Cecil uh, Erickson, in 1964. However, when Morris Hawk School opened in 1964, that very same year, the Penn State School became obsolete. In 1967, after one last lunch in the cafeteria, the school closed down for good. Over the ensuing decades, the building instead housed an autism service organization, a religious planning group, an architecture firm, and an employment agency, and possibly more. However, in the 1990s, the school was slated for demolition uh, to make way for the Alexander Road overpass over Route 1. In December 1994, many alumni held one last reunion to say goodbye, and within a few months, the school was gone for good. So now let's take a trip north to Plainsboro to the Wyckoff School. I wanna emphasize that prior to 1919, Plainsboro did not exist as an independent township. Instead, it was a historic community within Cranberry Township. And I believe depending on the time period, South Brunswick as well, depending on the area in Plainsboro. Similar to West Windsor, Plainsboro's oldest 
old wooden schoolhouses were becoming in increasingly obsolete and ad inadequate for the local youth in the early 1900s. And when Cranberry failed to provide a suitable replacement, Plainsboro's residents, residents decided to split off and create their own independent township. Now, one of the men who led this effort was uh, a guy named John Van Buren Wyckoff, who, because of his efforts and because of his popularity, uh, became Plainsboro's first mayor and head of its board of education. Um, and the school was named after him as a result as well, JVB Wyckoff. Over time, this institution has also physically expanded like all the others in West Windsor, Plainsboro. So today, kids have a variety of options to get to school. However, before the advent of the automobile, walking or riding to school was the preferred method of transportation. Even the, in, in the early 1900s, buses were often unreliable and got stuck in the mud during storms. But eventually they, of course, too became te more technologically capable. Uh, picture it as an old bus, uh, probably in the 1920s, uh, driven by a man named Gordon Pop Tyndall. He lived on a farm directly next to the Dutch Neck School, where Princeton Oaks is today. And he drove kids from, I believe, the 1910s until the 1960s. Uh, some former residents uh, I know might recognize this, uh, 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 might recognize uh, Gordon Tyndall um, and have some memories of him. So as I'd mentioned before, for most of its existence, West Windsor was an agricultural community with farm fields stretching as far as the eye could see until the late 20th century. During the early and mid 1900s, traveling farmers, otherwise known as migrant workers, uh, worked their way up the East Coast each year and uh, uh, working on farms that would have them and traveling back South during the winters. Uh, they often had children that came with them as well and attended the local schools. So class size swelled during the summer. Uh, these, uh, uh, the workers and the children were predominantly African-American or Hispanic, and may, many former residents remember them well, um, including perhaps, again, some that are on this call. Uh, notably across the nation, African-American children were often placed into special educational programming disproportionately, even if they did not belong there. Uh, now, I'm not sure if that's the case with the next photo, but I wanted to make that note just because it was, if, if not necessarily a local trend, at least a national one. So again, uh, special education programming, um, pictured as a special education class at, at Dutch Neck School, probably during the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, the teacher here, Ida William Engelke, was also principal of Dutch Neck School in the 1920s and 1930s. The earliest records that we have relating to local special education dates of the 1950s, although there may, of, cor of course, have been earlier initiatives. Um, special education has also, of course, expanded and evolved significantly over the decades. Um, I wanted to show this photo to emphasize that special education needs have always you know, existed, even if it's not often found in historical discussions. But this is one of my uh, favorite photos as it relates to West Windsor history uh, in relation to education. So now another topic that's not often thought about in West Windsor Plainsboro because of a robust public school system is homeschooling. In the mid 1900s, various companies were selling at-home learning programs so parents could teach their own kids. This was the case with Daniel and Dorothy Triffin who were West Windsor residents who opted to use the Calvert School's lesson plans over sending their own children, uh, uh, Maria, Daniel and Richard to public school. In 1961, uh, West Windsor Township filed a suit against them for this practice, arguing that the kids were better off in a classroom setting. However, the Triffins won in municipal court, especially after proving that their kids were in fact ahead of most other students. This set a precedent for New Jersey as a whole, which still permits homeschooling to this day, of course, under certain conditions. Now, as I previously mentioned, the Dutch Neck and Penn's Neck schools were built in 1917. At the time, West Windsor was almost entirely farmland, stretching as far as the eye could see, and it was sparsely populated. However, starting in the 1950s, West Windsor was beginning to experience suburban growth, like many farming communities across the nation after World War II. So in 1964, for the first time in uh, 47 years, another school opened in West Windsor, the Morris Hawk School on Clarksville Road. Within three years, this institution, whose first permanent principal was a man named Shelton Stern, had fully replaced this uh, Pensnex school. Of course, the Morris Hawk School has also grown significantly, 
since the, uh, I think this drawing is from 1962, since the drawing was made. So who exactly was Morris Hawk? And yes, his name is pronounced Morris, not Maurice. Um, well, he was a local resident who was born at the Skank Farmstead, coincidentally, and attended Rider University. Uh, I believe he majored in handwriting. Um, so obviously times have changed since then. Um, he was also a town's treasurer of almost 40 years, starting in the 1930s. Um, and his local contributions as the town's treasurer, as, the, uh, as a member of the West Windsor Board of Education, prompted the school to name the new school after him when it opened in 1964. Now, again, this was a time when uh, West Windsor was experiencing a lot of growth, uh, which prompted the township to and the school district to construct new institutions, again, like Morris Hawk, and expand others like the Dutch Neck School, uh, shown here in the 1950s, with a proposed expansion that was eventually approved by referendum. However, at the time, West Windsor, Plainsboro, and several other surrounding towns had no high schools of their own. Instead, they had everything up until grade eight. Um, so at the time, they sent their older students to high school in Princeton. However, Princeton, too, was growing and rapidly approaching capacity. This prompted them to warn us in the 1960s that they couldn't keep accommodating us for a lot, much longer. As a result, like uh, several surrounding towns, West Windsor began exploring the construction of building its own high school. In 1968, a group of 50 residents organized what was called the Committee of 50, to explore a possibility again of building a high school. And the next year, West Windsor and Plainsboro formally consolidated um, in order to split the cost of building a $7 million high school. Thus, after 140 years of experience, uh, sorry, of existence, the old West Windsor School District, which had formed in 1828, was dissolved and the West Windsor Plainsboro Regional School District was established in its place. So in the fall of 1973, the West Windsor Plainsboro High School opened for about 700 students, grades seven through 10. Its first principal was a man named Ronald Watson, who was assisted by Don Mannion and then Joanne Bartoletti as assistant principals. And eventually uh, Joan became uh, the principal of Dutch Neck School after Ronald Watson. In the spring of 1976, the school held a commencement on the front lawn for its first graduating class. The following year, the school's mascot was chosen to be the pirate, which beat out other options, including what I honestly think would be a better and more historically appropriate mascot, which is the Martian. Of course, the school has expanded over the years, and notably in 1997, when High School North opened in Plainsboro, the original high school's name was formally changed from the West Windsor Plainsboro High School to High School South, as it's been known now for, I think, more than half of its lifetime. Now, as I briefly alluded to earlier, uh, the first non-white principal in West Windsor was a woman named Almedia Pace. She joined the district in 1969 when it formed and served as principal at Dutch North School from 1974 to 1978, and then the Wythecoff School in Plainsboro until 1984. Uh, many alumni still vividly recall a warm-hearted educator who sang, who baked, and cared deeply for her students. And uh, I, I know that I've collected a number of memories about her uh, so I'm going to try to up update uh, this presentation when I have a bit more. It was also in the 1970s that two other higher uh, level institutions came to West Windsor. In 1972, Mercer County Community College opened a $22 million, 292 acre campus on Old Tretton Road with an estimated attendance of about 2,500 full-time students. Around the same time, the Mercer County Vocational School which straddles the West Windsor and Hamilton border, opened its doors just across the road for about 550 students. Mercer County Community College, for one, has grown significantly over the years and still serves students from across central New Jersey. One second. So, West Windsor's growth in the 1950s and 1960s, which again is a big, big common theme of West Windsor's history is growth, so that growth that started in the 1950s and 1960s only accelerated in later decades. This is especially true in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, in 1980, West Windsor had about 6,400 residents, um, but in the, by the year 2000, this had grown to about 22,000 residents. So more and more schools needed to be built. In 1987, 
Uh, the community middle school opened its doors on Grover's Mill Road in Plainsboro. Its longtime principal was a man named Arthur Downs, uh, and he was principal when I went there as well. And there were discussions about naming the school after him, although those never came to fruition. Also in 1987, the West Windsor Plainsboro Board of Education, uh, sorry, school district moved into an old building at 505 Village Road West in the heart of the community of Dutch Neck. This structure, which originally was built in the 1880s as a chapel, was also a Sunday school and later a library and courthouse before being purchased by the school district in 1987. Today, although most of the school district's offices have moved down the road to Village School, I believe the old chapel still houses some of the school district's functions, including, I think, its transportation offices. In 1990, so three years later, uh, after community middle school, and also three years after community middle school welcomed its first classes, the upper elementary school, otherwise known as UES, opened its doors directly next door. Its first principal, I believe, was Kay Gross, who served into the late 1990s. Uh, UES, I think, was formerly renamed Millstone uh, River uh, many years ago, and, uh, and this was an homage to the river that runs nearby and forms the border between West Windsor and Plainsboro. Next, in 1995, Village School opened its doors as well on New Village Road. Um, I believe Marilyn Hines was its first principal, and although I'm not certain, I'm under the assumption that it was named after the roads that bookend the property, New Village Road and Village Road East. Uh, several years ago, the school district moved its offices from the old Dutch Neck Chapel to this school. Now, in 1997, West Windsor turned 200 years old. That very same year, High School North was built in Plainsboro, across the road from Community Middle School and across the road from uh, uh, UES, or Millstone River. Um, and it was a counterpart to the old West Windsor Plainsboro High School, which after this point, again, was called High School South. High School North's first principal was Barbara Masonas, and she was principal, I think, for about four or five years. Finally, we get to the last of the West Windsor schools to be named after an individual, a boy named uh, Thomas R. Grover. So who exactly was he? But I'm sure uh, most of you might actually know who he is, um, but for those who don't. Um, he was a local farm boy who was born in 1946 at the farm just across the road, which is still farmland today. He was raised in an agricultural lifestyle and helped his family out on the farm. However, on March 8, 1965, the first wave of U.S. combat troops entered South Vietnam on the other side of the planet. And in May of 1968, Thomas began his active duty tour in South Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Less than a year later, Thomas R. Grover was killed in action, trying to guide his squad mates out of a deadly firefight. This makes him the only known West Windsor native who was killed in Vietnam. When West Windsor was considering, uh, considering building a new school in the 1990s, they wanted to originally install it on the family farm, the Grover family farm, but there was enough outrage, plus the fact that by that point, the farm had become uh, formally preserved land that it decided to move it to the property next door. Uh, the school formally opened in 1999, and its first principal was a man named Steve Mayer. The school still houses a collection of letters Thomas sent to his family while he was in Vietnam. And again, although his family farmhouse was torn down about a decade ago, uh, the farm is still in use with a plaque, sign, and a flagpole dedicated to its service in the property's history. And those are th that's the, this picture here. You can see the plaque in the center on a boulder, a sign saying the Grover Farm, and a uh, American flag half-mast. And this black flag is, a, I believe, a missing in action and prisoner, uh, a prisoner of war flag. So finally, the last school on the list and the most recent is Town Center in Plainsboro. This was opened in 2002, and its first principal was Marilyn Hines, who had just moved here from being the principal at Village School. So there's been a lot of change. Um, obviously, uh, there are a variety of different schools being built since the 1970s, but there's also been an, a, a, a change in other aspects as well. For one, uh, students uh, learned an expanding variety of subjects, uh, the adoption of more language options reflected the diversifying student body. Uh, standardized testing has become also more influential as college attendance has risen. Uh, computers have become more commonplace in the classrooms, libraries, and office, especially after the mid-1990s popularization of the internet. Uh, special education services, which again had already been provided since the mid-century, 
expanded and changed along with an evolution in approaches to neurodiversity. Uh, those looking for vocational studies could, as I mentioned, attend Mercer County Community College while in high school. Expanded offerings in the curricular and after school activities from clubs to sports teams and more further represented diversifying interests and needs. Uh, parents also became increasingly involved in their children's education, uniting to form various parent support groups. And I'm going to mention uh, uh, one of them uh, in a bit. Some also took advantage of an ever-growing uh, offering of adult education from computer literacy to crafts to English as a second language and GED classes. Starting a few decades ago, West uh, the district, so let me go back a bit. The district also began to earn a reputation for high performance. Um, and obviously that's one of the main draws for families to come to West Windsor uh, in the present day. In the 1992 to 93 school year, High School South earned the U.S. Department of Education's National Blue Ribbon Award of Excellence. The next year, Morris Hawk earned the same distinction. Since then, numerous other commendations have been bestowed on various individuals, on uh, the schools themselves, and uh, perhaps on the district for their various rigor and academic excellence, um, although some argue at a cost to, uh, of increased competition and stress for the students. However, perhaps notable, uh, uh, well, one of the most notable changes over the past few decades has been demographics. Prior to the 1980s, West Windsor was, for hundreds of years, an almost entirely white Christian farming community. However, in the past few decades, the township has dramatically grown and diversified significantly along racial lines, along ethnic lines, along religious lines, and various other identities, um, especially with new residents of Indian and Chinese origin. Uh, today, a little over half of the township is Asian American, and this has been especially notable with the school district. In 2022, almost three quarters of children are of Asian descent. A little over 15% are white, black and Hispanic students are about 5% east, uh, each. Uh, this profound change within just a few decades competes with the town's suburbanization to be the main theme of West Windsor's recent history. Now, curricula and student organizations also increasingly reflect the student body's composition. For instance, a popular youth group is the South Asian American Student Association, or SASA, you can, which you can see one of their performances here, I believe. Um, it, they come together every single year, um, uh, uh, students from various ethnicities to showcase traditional and contemporary cultural songs and dances. There are, of course, other identity organizations as well, such as Student Unions for Black, Jewish, and Korean Youth, a Youth NAACP, the NAACP chapter, as well as parent support groups, among others. Uh, one notable parent group is the African American Parent Support Group, which I believe formed in the mid-1980s to provide a community and a united voice for parents of students who are African American or in the Black diaspora. At home, only a little, uh, a, a little more than half of students' households speak English, others as, as the primary language. With other popular languages, including, but of course not limited to, Hindi, Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, Telugu, and Tamil. Private schools, academies, and tutors for various languages and cultures, and standardized testing preparation are also becoming increasingly commonplace as well. Now, as many homeowners know, uh, Westerns' growth in the past few years has also come at a cost. Sorry, not the past few years, the past few decades. Uh, the increasingly schemes, esteemed school district is obviously a draw for many families to move here. And one of the reasons that local housing prices are so high is because there's so much demand for people to move here. Uh, the proportion of local taxes going to the schools has also risen over the decades. Today, about 60% of the municipal tax levy goes to fund the school district which perpetually uh, needs to update its infrastructure and programs in order to keep pace with the ever-expanding population. So it's sort of a chicken, egg, a chicken and egg problem. So now as we approach the end of the lecture, of course, I'm sure uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention some of the more famous uh, local alumni. Uh, perhaps the most well recognized in the top left is the actor Ethan Hawke, an A-list uh, celebrity who, also, who spent a few years at high school south. He was a classmate with the next, um, uh, directly to his right, uh, Christopher McQuarrie, who's a famous screenwriter, director, and producer, as well as, again to the right, a man named James Murphy, who is the founder and lead singer of the world-famous band LCD Sound System. Uh, Anish Chopra, on the bottom left, 
uh, is the first chief technology officer of the United States, um, in, I believe under the Obama administration. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and, uh, um, and also went to high school south. Uh, meanwhile, uh, at high school north, there was Rebecca Sony in the bottom center, who was an Olympic, uh, or I don't know if she still competes, but at least was an Olympic gold medal, gold medal winner in swimming. And Felicia Zhang, the one on the right, was a, is an Olympic figure skater. There are a number of other famous individuals as well, but for the sake of brevity, I just wanted to highlight these specific individuals. Of course, a variety of other schools have served West Windsor over the decades that don't necessarily belong to the school district. Around town, you'll find a, var a variety of, and again, I could be butchering the pronunciation here, but Monterey schools, nurseries, and religious schools. And of course, there's increased offerings for tutoring, standardized test preparation, and other for-profit learning centers. Of course, West Windsor has also been affected by matters of national consequence. Uh, notably, about five years ago, there was a relatively uh, a heated discourse about whether to hire class three police officers to patrol various local schools. Uh, this came especially in an, area, in an era of more mass school shootings and bomb threats across the nation. And I'll, and I'll say myself, yeah, I remember in eighth grade when I was community middle school, there was a bomb threat there as well. So th this is a reality that is, you know, hit home, not just for other towns across the nation, but also West Windsor and Plainsboro. And even more recently, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, parents, students, teachers, and administration were forced to adapt to remote learning and uh, the needs of uh, uh, social distancing and everything that came with the pandemic. And shown here is a sign, uh, a, one of a few signs that were erected across town in support of teachers during the pandemic. Now, there is one final educational institution being built in West Windsor as we speak, uh, west of Route 1 and north of Washington Road uh, in a, uh, a property that used to be a very large farm field in the Penn's Neck neighborhood. There is a, uh, uh, that property is owned by Princeton University. Uh, for the past few years, they have been building what is called uh, what they are calling the West Windsor Meadows, which is a large property consisting of graduate student housing, research facilities, sports fields, and more. It's essentially a campus, uh, an extension of their campus, um, which I find a little bit uh, uh, ironic because until a few land annexations in the mid 1800s, West Windsor used to encompass all land in Princeton, southeast of Nassau Street, including Princeton University and Nassau Hall. Uh, but now Princeton University has kind of turned the tides and crossed over the Delaware and Raritan Canal into West Windsor. Uh, their campus surrounds the historic 1700s era Skang Covenhoven Cemetery, which is one of our town's oldest and most historically significant sites. And uh, they are uh, uh, apparently going to be incorporating that as a feature into their campus um, uh, and kind of highlighting the cemetery as a historic site. Um, and the, uh, the campus also incorporates the land upon which the original Penn's Neck Schoolhouse, which we explored at the beginning of this lecture, was built prior to the year 1760. So in a way, that very property where that schoolhouse once stood a few centuries ago is now being used for educational purposes once more. Another property that I'll highlight is, uh, uh, which has future implications, um, is right here at 221 Southfield Road. Um, just in the past few months, the school district purchased a 30-acre tract um, at 221 Southfield for a few million dollars. The district purchased it in anticipation of possibly needing to build another primary school in the future years as the town's population grips. Uh, this was also the site of one of West Windsor's oldest houses dating back to the early 1800s, uh, what I'm calling the Davis Chamberlain Perrine Farm after the uh, families that most commonly lived there. Um, and it was also the house of a former West Windsor mayor named Stanley Pry. Over the past few decades, as the township grew, there's been a long history of various entities from developers and individual homeowner, homeowners, especially uh, demolishing uh, various historic old sites in town. Um, and we, we asked the school district what their plans are and if they have any uh, a general uh, protocol for either moving or preserving historic sites. Um, but that has, you know, yet to be determined as to what they're going to be doing with the site. But I do know that there's an ongoing archaeological study, at least. Um, right now, what we can do is hope that the school district attempts to find a way to meet educational needs without necessarily affecting this historical site. So today, West Windsor serves 
a school, a, a, a student body of many tens, sorry, not tens, but many thousands of students, uh, which is far larger than the several dozen students that it started with in 1828. Again, I encourage everyone to visit the West Windsor History Museum next Sunday from one, sorry, two Sundays from now, from one to 4 p.m. to see our old 1800s era schoolhouse and explore more on the school system's history and that of the township in general. So that is the presentation. Um, let me, uh, sorry, I just closed out of the presentation. Let me share it one more time. I'm gonna go way off into the last slide so you can all see the information that I promised that I would give. So one second. A little, little bit of a, there we go. So that's the end slide. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here. I'm happy to take any questions. Again, we have a Westerners of History book, which you can uh, buy at the link here. You can also buy it at the upcoming open house. We have a variety of different events coming up this year, which you can see at westernersofhistory.com slash events. Our email is right in the center of the screen. And once again, uh, I strongly encourage everyone to either uh, to donate and volunteer for the Historical Society because we can't do this without community support. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions or if anyone has any memories they want to share, please do so. And I want to make sure everyone should be able to, yeah, everyone should be able to unmute themselves or feel free to type in the chat. So do we know who previously owned the farmland that became Princeton Meadows neighborhood? Uh, Princeton Meadows, uh, Josh, are you able to unmute yourself? Because I have a question, uh, where, where exactly is Princeton Meadows? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Hi, um, I, by the Meadows neighborhood, I'm, I mean the, uh, the Carnegie Lakeside campus, the Princeton University expansion. So it, dep it depends on the year, year you're talking about. Um, historically, the oldest families that owned it there in the mid-1700s were the Coven Hovens and the Skanks. Mm -hmm. uh, the, same, the same ones who, as, as you know, uh, are the namesakes of the Skank Coven Hoven Cemetery. Um, the, uh, the Later on, it was owned by the Jewell family, and I think the Coxes after that in the mid in the mid nineteen early to mid nineteen hundreds. But then Princeton bought up the land around the nineteen twenties and nineteen forties. Okay, yeah, I was curious because I was reading an article about the history of that land donation in the Princeton Alumni Weekly, and they didn't seem to know uh, who, like, I guess. It looked like some trustees wanted to buy the land from someone and donate it to the university, but they didn't know who they bought the land from. So I was more, uh, curious. Yeah, yeah. Now, those records, we can find them. I don't know off the top of my head, but it would have mm -hmm. been uh, probably the Jewel family. Then, gotcha. Because um, cool. I think they still live there, own the land in the early 1900s. I'm not sure, though. And that is that, that, that West Windsor Meadows property. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the in west of Route One and north of Washington Road. Gotcha. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, Yvonne, you remember the uh, Route One, the Pennstack Schoolhouse off of Route One? Uh, yeah, I, I think it also used to be a dog kennel owned by the O'Neill family as well in the 1980s. I think maybe the 1990s. I'm not sure, and maybe the 1970s. So someone else asked, is there a place where we can view the historical photos used in the slideshow and others? One of them, I would recommend coming to our open house. So if you go to, and I'm going to share my screen again, um, if you go to, oh, it is, there we go, share screen. Uh, there we go. So if you go to our events calendar, westwindsorhistory.com slash events, you're going to see a link to our open house, which is coming up two Sundays from now, and that's at the West Windsor History Museum. Um, so one place to see these photos and to see dozens of photos of old classes, of, uh, of students, of teachers, a variety of different things relating to West Windsor history beyond education, I'd recommend coming to the museum. Again, we're at 50 Southfield Road. We're right across the road from the Cranberry Golf Course and literally a minute down the road from Grover Middle School. 
if you look for the uh, a white an old white farmhouse a long gravel driveway if you look for farm fields or a red barn you're going to find us we're the only 1700 zara a white farmhouse directly across the road from the Grand Bay Golf Course. Um, and Arun, I see you have a question too. And yes, Susan, the West Windsor Meadows is behind the Elma Lee. But Arun, are you you're able to unmute yourself? That might be easier. Oh, cannot unmute. Okay. You know what I mean? I'm going to try asking you. Maybe that should work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I can talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for wonderful information. And I can appreciate your time and uh, 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 doing all the slides and all that stuff. Uh, good information. Princeton Meadows. I just wanted to clarify because when Josh mentioned Princeton Meadows, as far as I know, the location is in Plainsboro. Uh, so that area near that, uh, you know, the heart of Plainsboro, that's where is Princeton Meadows. But I think Josh later corrected himself. So that's what I wanted to tell. Yeah, I didn't type it uh, very clearly, but I meant Meadows neighborhood of the Princeton campus. Right, yeah. right. Because I was just there for some showings, like, you know, a couple of weeks back. And I said, wait a second, what's the thing? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> But everything, yeah. Uh, thank you again, uh, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I used to that campus. I know Princeton was, uh, 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 at least even a year ago, it was planning on calling the campus the Lake Campus because it's next to Lake Carnegie or Carnegie Lake. Um, but they named it in the past several months to West Windsor Meadows. Uh, so that, I, that's the property directly. Yes, next to I, I work at Princeton and I didn't know that until this week. I thought it was called the Lake Campus too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was until recently, I guess, which I'm happy. I'm happy. You know, usually you see businesses and variety of things on Route 1 call themselves Princeton, even though they're in West Windsor. And actually, Princeton itself is recognizing West Windsor. So I'm happy about yeah. that. Yes. And I would also vote for West Windsor rather than Princeton all the time. Yeah. So that that's good that they're calling it that way. Yeah. Lake is what? Like everyone knows Carnegie Lake. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. By the way, in case anyone else wants to unmute themselves, I realized I did not previously enable that. So if anyone has any questions and they want to unmute, feel free. Well, uh, so I'll just say quick question. So we're all saying Maurice Hawk wrong. Maurice yes. Hawk. Yeah, it's Morris Hawk. It's not spelled <laughs> M-O-R-R-I-S, but it's pronounced like it is. Morris, Morris Hawk. So if I start using that, Everyone's going to think I'm confused, but I'll really be yeah. correct. All right. <laughs> you'll, have, you'll have the historical society backing you up. Yeah, perfect. Um, <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, if no other questions, then I just want to say thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Uh, it was great to have, have this lecture. Great to see you all here. And again, I want to emphasize that we're going to have an open house two Sundays from now from 1 to 4 p.m. You can find it on our website. Please volunteer. Please donate. Um, and thanks once again. Everyone have a good night. Thanks, Paul.